Well, welcome all. Um, and uh, I think all of the boards kind of do this pretty much every year when they've got new members coming in. When there hasn't been new members, they haven't done training. So what I did was I took the training from Pauline found the PowerPoints from before and I kind of updated them and then we added a couple of little things at the end of the meeting. So we've titled this, you know, Building Board of Appeals 101, but what this really is is you know, the first lecture on the first day of the 101 course. We're not going to go too deep on this. Uh, so, actually, I think that you guys have some very, very interesting powers. Uh, and so, uh, all of the building codes that the city has adopted, you are the board of appeals that hears anything that happens under those building codes. And so, until it actually happens, we don't know what provision of those building codes or those you know, fire codes or whatever applies. And until that time, you know, until the staff tells us, we don't know what exactly that would be. So under uh, section 411 of the code, it lists all of the codes that are adopted. And then section 413 says, you're the board that hears anything that's on those appeals. You also can determine suitability of alternate materials might be something in the code that says certain standards, but there's other things that might meet those standards, and then you can interpret those things and decide whether those would apply. You also get to hear stuff regarding suspensions and revocations and licenses under Title III, Chapter 16. I don't think this ever has happened, but you have that. And then there's uh, authority to hear cases under the International Fire Code and the Fire Code provisions are under a different part of the chapter. They're not part of the building codes that are adopted, but you are designated to hear those things as well. So it's kind of, I mean, I think it's a, I was surprised how many duties you have and, you know, hopefully you never have to exercise it, right? <laughs> but we'll see what happens. Just as an overview, we're home rule city, and as a home rule city, our charter is sort of our constitution. That governs or sets the framework for governing the city. And as with the constitution, you pass statutes under that, and then there's regulations under the statutes. For the city, we have our constitution as the charter, and then we pass ordinances as kind of our statutory authority. And so the um, as part of that, the um, council has adopted the building codes and the things that you guys are required to you know, hear if there's a dispute. Um, as a home rule city, we can enact stuff that's different than state statutes as long as there's not a conflict. So let me give you an example. A few um, months back, there was the big brouhaha at the Capitol because uh, used to be all of the oil and gas regulations were controlled by the state, which preempted the field. And so if a local government says, we don't want a drilling rig in a residential neighborhood, if it was permitted under state statutes, it had to be, you had to allow it. And what they did was essentially take that back. And they said, we are no longer as the state going to preempt the field, and we will let the cities then uh, regulate oil and gas within its municipal boundaries. So as long as this legislature hasn't acted to preempt, in other words, we're going to occupy the field and nobody else can occupy it, then the city can move in and regulate in zoning or building or other things of that sort. Now, typically, if the field is not preempted, you can, as long as what the cities do is not inconsistent, with what the state statute does, you generally can do that. But if it's more restrictive, it would be uh, forbidden. But so uh, it, it's 
kind of one of those technical things that I have to get into if I'm defending the city. But uh, for the most part, home rule municipality has authority to adopt all the building codes and do all the stuff that's done. And there's no conflict with state statutes because the states don't regulate that kind of stuff, except on if it's a state property within the, the jurisdictional limits of the city, then they get to tell how they want the, the building code to be done. Usually the cities can't veto that. So the city has adopted uh, procedural rules that apply to all of its boards and, co and commissions. So it makes it easy for those of us who have to do multiple boards. It's all the same rules. It applies. So, you know, it's in this, I should have put the site in here. Um, it's, it's in the in, in the code, and I think it's probably in there. It's in your packet, so uh, you should just spend some time reading through that. It's not complicated, and if there's any issues, there's usually somebody from the city attorney's office and Colleen, who's done this many times, can help you through it. Okay? Now, I know they've handed you all the Robert's Rules of Order. Under those uh, procedural rules in the city, they don't strictly adopt Robert's Rules of Order. So I always kind of joke that it's more like Bob's guidelines that we follow in the city, right? We don't have all the strict requirements of, you know, Robert's Rules. But I think Robert's Rules serves a very good function in, in making boards uh, efficient in operating. So, you know, having a motion in a second, yes, we have to do that. If there's a friendly amendment, usually we can adopt that. But if there is some sort of amendment that's, that's separate, you got to have a separate vote on that. You vote on that first. If it's incorporated, then you vote on the main motion. And so there's a procedure for that so that we, you know, make sure. Mostly the reason, and we'll talk more about this, is we got to make a clear record of what we've done. If for some reason somebody challenges it or whatever, then I have to go to court and defend it. We want to have a clear rule of how it's done, so we want to have, you know, sort of standard procedures for how we've created our record. So, several stages of your meeting, and usually you're going to be asked to do something that's in an evidentiary hearing. We'll talk about some other possibilities, but I don't see it happening very often. So, in an evidentiary hearing, you have the two... Two elements, really, the fact presentations, and then you deliberate and do your fact finding. And that's a public thing, unlike a jury that would go in private and deliberate. You need to deliberate publicly and state the reasons for your actions. So the fact presentation, usually it starts by the city staff. Um, and the good thing about this is, is they'll go through all of these building codes or all these adopted codes and say, what provisions apply and what issues are, you know, and they will distill all that down for you. You don't have to go and find all that stuff. And so they will bring that to you. Um, and then the opposing side will give their argument as to that. Um, and then the public has a right to um, participate in the meeting. I maybe should take a step back. Um, 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution says no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Okay? We don't have the death penalty on this board. Uh, <laughs> we don't block anybody up, right? But we do impact people's property interests. So in impacting those property interests, we have to get due process. Right? So what processes do, these rules have been sort of tested into courts, and this is good. But members of the public, if you're an you know, adjacent property owner or you're down the street or behind them or whatever, you have a property interest in your property that may be impacted by something this board does. And so then generally we want the members of the public to have an opportunity to participate, give that input for you to make a decision. So because you're serving as kind of a jury or a quasi-jury in this process, you need to keep an open mind. You, need to, you can't make up your mind just because staff says something. You know, to hear everybody else and see. It happened the other night, somebody from the public came up toward the end and just made a really good point. Everybody was like, wow, we didn't think of that. And then they altered what they did in putting in their motion to incorporate this really good idea. So keeping an open mind, there's no downside to it. You know, you get to hear that. So, uh, and you can ask clarifying questions. What are you trying to tell us? Make sure I understand what you're trying to tell us so that I can then use that information uh, appropriately. And then you get to make your decision. Now, as 
far as I'm concerned, if I'm at the, I don't think, I don't have a vote. I'm going to help, I'll listen to what you're doing and try to help you as a problem solver get to the sort of conclusion you want and make sure that we make the appropriate record. And, and so I sort of see my role as the preserver of the record, making sure that everybody gets due process. Okay? So because it's a quasi-judicial, I mean, we're not having a judge, we don't have that ruler. Um, what the quasi-judicial guidelines require. So the city will be one of the parties and present usually through staff. Um, on rare occasions, I've seen where cities might hire somebody to come present for the staff or hire somebody outside to present, but usually it's city staff. And then there's usually an applicant or a property owner that has an issue and they have a personal you know, property interest that is directly affected by this decision. Okay? So after you get the notice of the hearing that there's a particular property, you should try to keep an open mind and not do anything that will get you, you know, making ex parte communications with the owners or the neighbors or anything, because we need to have that on the record to preserve that. So if somebody was coming up to you and say, you know, I know you're on the uh, Board of Appeals and I want to hear, you know, I want you to hear, you know, you could politely say, you know, I need to be neutral. I need to hear both sides. I think it would be great if you would come to our meeting when we're hearing that and let us hear what you have to say so that all the board members hear it, not just me, right? And I think you can be just as polite as possible, but I think you want to make sure that you're not hearing something that's outside of what would be part of the record at the hearing. Usually, you know, you shouldn't make individual site visits and go do your own investigation or anything like that. And sometimes really hard. I mean, it could be a property you live down the block from it, or you drive by it every day, you know, sort of thing. So typically what we will do is if, if somebody has made a site visit or communicated with others, we will try to bring that into the meeting and make it part of the record. So like on the Board of Adjustment, the chair does this really great thing. You know, he says, first of all, has any members of the board been by the property? And people say, yeah, I drive by that when I go to work. Or, I, you know, I've been by there. Did you speak to anyone? And if you did, what did they say? So what you've done now is taken that information that was outside the meeting and you're now incorporating it into the meeting so that you know what everybody knows and everybody now knows the same thing. Okay? We had an issue with the uh, council a couple months ago that they were getting all sorts of emails on this controversial thing, and some of the council members you know, felt compelled because they're council members to start answering it. And it was, well, does, have they prejudged this by what they said in this? And you know, so we were coming up with a solution maybe that we would bring everybody's emails in and everybody's answers, make them part of the record. Well, fortunately, then the applicant withdrew its application and. It, problem went away. So, you know, if, if you're getting a lot of that, we need to try to make it part of the record so that we know what's the basis of your decision. So, you got to remember, you got to be fair and impartial as decision makers, and if you have any information from outside, you need to disclose it. Now, if it's information from outside that you have a bias, right, this house is, or this property is next door to you, and you don't want it to happen, we may have to recuse you. It may be something that you don't vote on, right? And then we have an alternate step in, sort of thing. So, you know, we'll have to see how that goes or how, um, you know, if the interest is personal to you. But if your interests are just as a member of the board, and then we're just going to make a record of you've done these type of visits, which are not inappropriate. It's just we need to make it part of the record. Paul, is there, is there any hearsay issues there with John's told me at the site? Yeah. Such and such. Like, if I was the applicant's counsel, I would, you know, probably object to that. Yeah. Be considered. And there's, <laughs> when, when I took evidence in law school, the, uh, the professor that taught evidence says that if you as a trial lawyer can't get hearsay into the evidence, you're not working hard enough. There's about 15 exceptions to the hearsay rule. Okay. And... Hearsay means something very specific to lawyers in this context. So hearsay would be, it's something said by an out-of-court declarant. And 
it's said in your, it's being admitted into evidence for the truth of the matter asserted. Okay, so it needs to be both of those things. Out of court declared and asserted for the, or admitted for the truth of the matter asserted. So if you're out there at a scene and somebody comes up and says something to you, they may not show up at hearing. If they show up at hearing, they're not an out of court declarant. They could say it again on the record and make it part of the record. Okay? If they say it to you and don't show up, you can say, I heard this information. I don't know if it's true or not. I'm going to hear the evidence that's presented. But I just heard this information. And so all it is then is a foundation for part of the decision or is declaring that you had this visit, not, not accepting it as true. Okay? So it's only hearsay if you're accepting it as true. So, you know, like a peace officer goes out and investigates a crime. People tell peace officer stuff all the time that's not true. Right? But it is a step in their investigation. Right? So based on that information, I did X to either confirm or refute what I was told. So it can be evidence for only the purposes of saying this is the next step in the investigation. Or because I heard that, I'm very interested in hearing from the applicant something and you ask a clarifying question. Now all of a sudden we've made that a non-issue because you've given the applicant a chance to respond to it. Okay? It's a very good question. It's very subtle. Okay, so the order of proceedings in these, and you've probably all been through staff presentation, then the applicant presentation, and then the presiding officer opens for public, and then there's usually a limit on uh, what each person can say. Final presentations, and then you close the public hearing, and you do what they pay you the big money for and make a decision, right? So the staff, usually it's an overview of the facts and issues. Very often there's history. You know, this was zoned at this point and it got approved to do this and the zoning has since changed, you know, things like that that would be relevant for your decision. Uh, they usually summarize, and usually staff has had some discussion with the applicant before it gets to your level. So they sort of summarize that process and what's all come together. Uh, they will then go and comb those building codes and find those applicable provisions to bring before you. And then you can apply those rather than you have to go search that stuff out themselves or yourselves. The staff always makes a recommendation as to what they feel you should do. And this is your chance to ask them questions. Okay, have you been out? What did you see? You know, what has what the applicant said? How has this evolved over time? You know, how have you seen how other cities have applied this uh, building code? If not, you know, things like that. You can ask those questions and try to get as much information into the record for purposes of making a decision as you can. Same thing with the applicant. They usually don't repeat what the staff has said, but they supplement. All right, this is what our concerns is as the property owner. This is what we're thinking because we have a business to operate or something like that. So they bring in that broader context, those other considerations. They're going to be advocating. They want you to say yes for whatever they want to do. So. Again, you're encouraged to ask questions, bring as much information as you can in so that you have a chance to make a decision. Then you open the public hearing, and usually we ask people to sign up so we kind of know how long that's going to take. Not always do they sign up. Usually we limit to three minutes a person. But these are the people who are members of the community, think how the community should be, they're neighboring property owners, something like that. And we can then take into account their input as to the issue that's before you. And generally, there's not a lot of questions to those people that are substantive. It might be clarifying. I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean by you know, a certain term or something like that. But typically, they get their three minutes. You listen politely, and you take it in. Uh, sometimes, um, <laughs> sometimes they get a little off the beam. They start saying, you know, we think the zoning on this property is wrong and stuff like that. They only got three minutes. So if, it, if it's too much of that, I usually get the hook and say, I'm sorry, that's not a topic that's before the board, but, uh, or the chair can sort of say, you know, well, we don't decide that issue. You understand our issues are limited to these things. So would you address those things and then see what they say? After the public hearing, the, the staff and the applicant get to rebut that. 
you know, whatever they heard in that presentation, they get to respond to that. And so, again, it's your final opportunity to ask the staff and the applicant questions. So, you know, oftentimes staff will say, well, we have nothing else to ask. Well, then you're just going to say, Mrs. Jones said something in the, um, the public comment, and it raised a question for me I want to direct to staff. And you get a chance to ask those questions if you need to do that, okay? So, at this point, you've now sort of gathered all of the information in that you have to decide on, and you close the public hearing. And we were discussing this, you know, before the meeting. So, you entertain a motion by the boards as to how to proceed. Now, somebody might move to say, I, let's grant that, and it doesn't get a second. Well, then that motion dies, or that gets a motion in a second, but that doesn't pass. So you may get more than one motion, but you have to wait and see um, what the motion in the second is, and then after you have a motion in a second, you have discussion about it. And usually this is the opportunity for you as individual board members to say what you found persuasive. What was the evidence that you saw that was, was useful to you in helping you decide the way you're deciding? It's also the opportunity, though, to listen to your other members. I mean, you don't have to have your feet in concrete when you start making these comments. You could say, I'm leaning this way, or I'm persuaded by these facts. I'm, I would like to hear what the rest of the members have to say because they may persuade you. So you can keep your, you know, your mind open at that, but you should keep it sort of to the relevant guidelines. You know, again, you shouldn't be talking about, well, I don't think the zoning is appropriate on this property. Well, that's not before you. You know, council passed the zoning map. That's you know somebody else's problem. You can only discuss the stuff that's before you. And what we're trying to do now is build a complete record as to why you made the decision you made. So that somebody challenges that and we've got to go to court to defend it, I could, and it's an appeal on the record, I can go to the record and say, this is what they did, they considered these facts, they considered this evidence, all of what they did was reasonable. Yes, it's not in, it's in the Board of Adjustment presentation there, but the, the, the court has to be very forgiving for your decisions. It's not whether the court would have made the same decision that you would. It's whether there's evidence in the record to support it. And so that's why it's important that we have as much evidence in the record and that you evaluate that as part of your discussion so that we can show to the court, you know, you don't get to second guess this decision. These are the folks that live in this community and they got appointed for this board. But what they did, they had evidence in the record to support it and you should affirm it. So, legislative role, where do you wear this hat? I don't see too many opportunities because council adopts all of the codes that you are supposed to interpret. Now, what you could do, I would think, is, you know, so you get information that we're using an outdated fire code or something, and you might say, you know, other uh, cities are now adopting the newer fire code and stuff like that. You might want to do some analysis from a legislative standpoint where you recommend to council that they apply stuff more, you know, a, a different version and adopt a different code. So that would sort of be a legislative act. For that, you don't have to have quasi-judicial, you know, you don't have to hear from all sides. You could just have staff come in and say, you know, why don't you do some research for us and say, what are the other cities? Are they adopting a newer version of this code? And then you can make recommendations to council. So I think it would be things like that. You don't have to have, I mean, there wouldn't be a particular applicant, there wouldn't be a particular property you were addressing, so you wouldn't have to open it for a public hearing, and then if you decided to vote as a group, we recommend to council that they adopt a new code, then you can do that and pass that on to council. So I think there is opportunities for that, but I don't know that they'll happen very often. Regulatory role, I don't see this happening for you guys. You know, like in the... Um, Historic Preservation Board, they have some stuff where they do on, you know, encouraging, you know, people to learn education programs about the history of the city. They might have some programs for that, and, you know, it, it, or they might have some guidelines on, you know, this is how we perceive, you know, certain aspects of what's historic and what's not. Your role is pretty much cut and dry in those codes. You get to interpret them, but you don't get to really pass any regulations that go with that. I'm going to switch gears, so if there's any questions about that, we should ask those now. But um, 
You are subject to the open meetings law. That's why this is being broadcast now and recorded and things like that. And this is just what it says. It well, I do have a question on procedure. Yeah. When you're doing the wrap up, you let the city talk first and then the applicant. Mm -hmm. And then they sit down. And then when you're getting ready to have your discussion or call them back up, you call them back up individually. Is that correct? You, you don't. Right. While they're presenting, you don't ask them questions and each other. Yeah. Well, usually they will present. They have a, well, particularly the staff will have a canned presentation. Right. You know, and if there's aspects of that, uh, usually what I see is they make notes. Sometimes if they just misspeak or something like that, somebody say, did you mean, oh, yeah, yeah, so we get that fixed right away. Right. Um, but usually they say, would you go back a couple of slides to where you have that photo? Or will you go back a couple of slides where you had that provision that's, a, and then you'd ask the questions about that. And then the same sort of thing uh, with the applicant, if they've got some sort of, and they often have put stuff on the, um, the overhead screen and things like that. You can ask, could I see that again, or whatever, and then ask you questions. Um, typically that doesn't happen with, you know, the public. Sometimes they bring in photos or whatever, but you don't ask them a lot of questions. But then when you close the public hearing, you know, then that's all the evidence that's in. Okay. So open meetings. Paul, can I just interrupt? Real sure, sure. So during the, the actual public comment part, our, our public is really just using their three minutes to speak to whether they are in favor of or in opposition to whatever, but you're not actually conversing with the public. Right. They get their three minutes. Yeah. You don't get to ask questions of the public. Generally, no. Yeah. It, you know, I mean, it, if you need it and you feel it, yeah, I would rather have a full record than have it cut off. You know, or somebody said, well, you know, how do you know this? Or, you know, ask that kind of question just for your edification. That's fine. You know, we, we were the other night, they were asking this member of the public all sorts of questions, and her three minutes was now seven minutes, right? And, Fortunately, she was the only person speaking, but if you get into that, then you create a can of worms because that person doesn't really have an oath and, you know, how much should we rely on that? But um, it, it's worth listening, and I think it's worth asking a, you know, a, a pointed, clarifying question. But if you get into a big discussion, I think you're going to get off the beam. Okay? So a meeting for purposes of the statute is any kind of gathering convened to discuss the public business. And that can be done in person, by phone, electronically, any means of communication. If you guys are all on Skype together, it's a meeting. Okay? Now, it has to be a quorum or three or more members of the body. Okay? Which is, and they have to be discussing an action, uh, and it has to be a meeting open to the public. Now... The city's very good about, you know, noticing all of these and doing all this stuff thing, but it has to be something that's within your purview, right? So what's not a meeting? Social gathering. So if, when you guys were at the board uh, dinner the other night and you start t discussing generally, gee, we got another meeting, you know, this week or next week or whatever that is, that's not a meeting, okay? Um, you may be discussing something of, of public importance, but that doesn't necessarily make it a meeting for you unless it's something within your purview as a board. So if you're discussing some zoning issue or some develop on, on a new property, but it's not something that's before you, it could be a matter of public importance, but it's not something you will ever address as within your purview. You're okay to discuss that, you know, if you run into each other in the grocery store or whatever. You know, you, it's, it's a matter of public importance where Blacko is going to save the Broncos. But it's not before you as part of your purview, so you're welcome to discuss that amongst yourself, right? So if it's within your purview, and particularly if there is an applicant or a dispute that's coming before you, then you shouldn't talk about it unless it's a noticed meeting, okay? Again, we want everything in the record as part of that, okay? The city will give full and timely notice, and I always turn to Colleen. Tell us all the places that you post notices of this. We post um, on our website calendar 
Um, also on our videos page calendars, it's two places on the website. We post in the lobby of this building, the municipal court, and uh, the library. So we get that notice out there, and then for a meeting we have to keep minutes, and we have to follow all the rules and regulations, and take formal actions. Now the formal action could be, we're going to table this to a day certain and talk about it later, or postpone the discussion, but it is an action. If you don't follow the open meeting rules, the court can declare everything you did the way. Right? And the person that complains about it, the city will have to pay them <laughs> for the privilege of suing the city. So when I say I feel like I'm here to protect the record, and to protect, I'm trying to avoid stuff like this from happening. Right? So I want to make sure that everything is done. You know, We've jumped through all the right hoops and we protect the records. I'm not here to tell you what to do. Okay? So, a meeting can happen via social media or email. The, the um, city tends to be very good when they send you a notice of a meeting that they send it to you as a blind copy so that if you respond, you're not responding all and everybody's not seeing it. Right? So it can't be declared a meeting. Now, if you're responding and it says, you know, all right, is that 6.30 or... or is, Six o'clock for the meeting, well, yeah, that's not substantive, so that's not a problem. But if you're commenting on the substantive issues before the board, it could be considered part of the meeting. And then we may have to say, you know, all right, how do we bring that into the record to make sure that that's here? Okay. Be careful, you know, if you've got stuff on your Facebook pages or if you've got a group chat about something that you're not cross-communicating on something that's coming before the board because it may constitute part of a meeting and I may have to try to figure out how to put a band-aid on it. Okay? So I'm just saying that uh, try to be careful about things like that. Um, you know, it's sort of an appearance of impropriety action. If somebody's going to question it, then you probably should just say, no, I can't do that, right? The city doesn't permit this, the meetings to be hosted electronically or to people to call in, but under the open meetings law, that would happen. So if you guys were not having a meeting, but you decided to have a, you know, a, a, a group phone chat about something, uh, it would constitute a meeting and it could be a problem. We would need to have a public notice find some way to record that phone call or something, if, even if that were to happen. I have seen situations where, um, you know, a member of a, a council or a member of a board was injured but wanted to participate and call in. We're going to have to handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it typically doesn't happen, but um, particularly if we need somebody for a quorum, <laughs> you could, we might want to stretch the rules a little bit just to make sure we could act. So that's sort of what I wanted to cover, just sort of as uh, keep an eye out for certain things as you move forward. I'm happy to answer questions or brainstorm with you as things come up. So good. You are awesome. <laughs> awesome. Uh, one thing... Um, because we're interim city attorneys and because um, we're paid by the hour, if you have questions that you want to present to me, usually go through Colleen and then the uh, city manager's uh, secretary is sort of filtering those things because if it can be answered by staff or it can be answered by somebody that doesn't bill the city by the hour, they'll, they'll find that answer for you. Uh, if you call me and I write down the time, then they don't have any control over the budget. So, you know, usually we'll funnel stuff through Colleen before it comes to me so the city has control of their budget. But I'm happy to answer your questions, even if I have to write it off, because that's what I do. Well, thank you, Paul. I think that was very informative. Um, Trying to figure ahead on stuff. Do we have any other business tonight? Uh, we don't, and unless the um, board has... Any general any questions? Any general questions or comments or anything they want to see happen with the board in the next year? I can't wait to get any comments. Well, if, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them.
have an opportunity, go through the package that's been provided for you. And if you have questions about anything in there, you know, do shoot me a quick email or pick up the phone and call me or, or whatever. Yeah. Do we have a meeting scheduled for this board? For this uh, we do not right now. Nobody's asked for anything from you, so I guess that's good news. We may meet uh, for some study sessions. Uh, and we can certainly do that. Yeah. Yeah, you um, and I can chat about that. Because we learned a lot going through the, the last uh, oh, do we? <laughs> appeal. <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was kind of like slow going, even from the like, okay, what do I do now? Kind of thing, so. Oh, and the other thing we could do is as that uh, that case progresses, I suspect you're going to just have a professional curiosity about it. Uh, I could come back and sort of tell you where the litigation is and what we're doing and how we're putting that together. Because right now, staff is like putting together all you know the bills and everything, and then we're going to have to file a lien and start jumping through some hoops, but we might be able to do that at part of a study session in the future, too, just to see how things come out. Because yeah, I think it'd be interesting for us to get closure on things that happen. Right. So, and if there's no objection, uh, we will adjourn. So we don't have any pending appeals right now? Not yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> he said the word. We have, we have some that are kind of dancing around, but we don't have any that are actually Make it go away. Try to handle Well, the staff is really good at that. You know, figuring out ways to get things resolved so they don't get to this point. And it's just usually when you know, can't figure out a way around that thing. Come to the boards and say, you know, how, do we, how do we get through this mess? Sometimes the answer is no, and then they're back at staff trying to figure it out again. Right? Well, I look forward to looking at it. Thank you.